What's up Lazy Dog fam? Hope everybody out there is having a fantastic day. On our last video we had part one of our interview with Jim Gerritsen of Wood Prairie Potato Farm up in Maine and now it's time for part two of that great interview we had with Jim. If you missed part one there was lots of great information on it. We talked about potato growing tips. You know, do you plant cut potatoes, whole potatoes? If you're going to cut them up, how do you cut them up? All kind of good stuff there. If you missed part one, you probably want to watch that before watching this part two. And I'll put a link to part one down in the description below. So in part two, Jim's going to talk about this whole biofumigation thing that you've probably heard us talk about before and seen us do in several of our garden plots. Going to talk about how they use that to reduce their pest pressure on their potato farm up in Maine. He's also going to cover this whole determinate versus indeterminate potato thing you've probably heard a lot of people talk about. He'll talk about what's a good multiple as far as how many pounds of seed potatoes you plant and then how many pounds you should get at harvest and then he's going to dig into some of their varieties that they have there at wood prairie farm talk about which varieties are great for containers which are the best tasting varieties which are more forgiving or easier to grow and which varieties give the best yields and if you want to try any of these great potato varieties that Wood Prairie has, you can go to their website, woodprairie.com. You can use the code LazyDogFarm to get 5% off your order. So grab you a notepad, sit down, hope you enjoy part two of this interview. All right, everybody, we're back for part two, our interview with Jim Gerritsen here from Wood Prairie Farm. If you missed the first part, we talked a lot about potato growing tips and, and how Jim grows his seed potatoes up there in Maine. Uh, this particular part, part two, we're going to get into some uh, rotation practices, talk a little bit about biofumigation, and then talk about some of the varieties that Jim has there, Wood Prairie Farms, that you can order seed potatoes for and grow yourself. So let's jump into this biofumigation deal. This is something we've talked about on our channel quite a few times, and it's gotten, I've been so successful with it, or it has worked so well for me that now I try to, in the fall, I try to already determine where my potatoes are going to go in the spring. You know, we have nine or 10 plots or so. So I try to go ahead and plan out where I'm going to want to plant potatoes. And then I grow this cover crop of mustard. And we've tried several different types from fairly mild stuff that you can still eat to the really, really spicy stuff. And um, there's a decent amount of research out there as far as you know the biofumigation effects and how it helps with pests but you've also done this firsthand on your farm so i thought i'd let you share um so somebody could hear it from somebody other than me yeah yeah well i, I we're believers uh we've been um biofumigating for about 20 years um in our case uh we went to a lecture at an organic conference and uh, the lecture was given by Dr. Tim Griffin, who at that time was uh, a scientist working for USDA uh, ARS Ag Research Service. And he had been doing some uh, studies um, indicating that by turning under a brassica crop, that as the leaf matter of that uh, brassica, as it decomposes, it gives off a gas that um, functionally is quite similar to uh, the deadly chemical uh, methyl bromide, which is a, uh, an ozone depleter a chemical that really should have been banned by now, but uh, a lot of farmers find a need for it and want to keep using it, so they, uh, they keep postponing the banning of it. But what it does, it cleanses the soil, so it cuts down pathogenic fungi, uh, that could lower the quality of a crop like potatoes. So um, uh, fungi like uh, fusarium, rhizoctonia, pythium, uh, those are all uh, funguses that live in the soil. And if you can suppress them, you're going to get a better crop because they will feed on potatoes and colonize on potatoes if they if they get the chance. So. Uh, we started doing this based on Dr. Griffin's uh, advice, and we found that it was quite beneficial. So after we'd been doing it for five or 10 years, uh, some additional scientists from the University of Maine and additional scientists from USDA ARS, they wanted to document 
its effectiveness. So we uh, we did a four-year uh, task. They came on to our farm, used our fields, and basically at the end of four years, uh, they were able to document what we already knew as farmers was working, but they came up with peer-reviewed research, published mm -hmm. it in scientific journals, uh, documenting that this, uh, uh, what they call biofumigation, you're basically cleansing the soil using biology rather than uh, chemistry uh, and getting um, the benefits of um, higher quality uh, tubers, higher yield, because you're, some of those um, funguses will actually suppress the growth. And you're actually getting, uh, um, they, they determined that about 15% of weed seed was killed by this. And it's simply because that brassica as it's uh, rotting in the soil, it gives off a gas and that gas is cleansing. So the, um, what we've been using for biofumigant is rapeseed, which is a uh, cousin to uh, canola. Uh, mm -hmm. We got into that because we preferred, um, it, it's a biennial. So under in, in most uh, conditions, it will not bloom that same year that we're growing it. It would have to overwinter to bloom. and uh, we would just as soon, you know, we, we imagined kind of a disaster scenario of getting a, a wet fall that we couldn't get in to incorporate that and, and the uh, maybe a warm fall that was wet, the, um, say a mustard that would then, that's an annual set seed and then come back to plague us the next year is a weed problem. And uh, wild mustard is one of the weeds that we have to deal with. So we just, didn't think too kindly about um, uh, possibly introducing a weed seed. Now, um, the, the rape seed has worked very well for us. They say that the top two um, uh, varieties, there's Ida red mustard, uh, which I think they developed in Idaho or Pacific Northwest. That's supposed to be number one. And this rape seed that we've been using is supposed to be number two. So um, we try to be conservative and go about things minimizing our risk. So the rapeseed seem to do it for us. And um, up where we are, we plant it uh, uh, the 1st of August and uh, uh, we pray for rain. If we know a rain is coming, we'll uh, uh, break our necks just getting it in there because we can get maybe a jump of a, a week or 10 days if we get it right before a rain. So, and then we incorporate this year, we incorporated on uh, Veterans Day on the 11th day of November, which was relatively uh, late, but we had a heavy rain coming and we thought we better get this in because uh, we might not be able to get back in the field. But uh, uh, it does, it decomposes and prior to the ground freezing over. And then the next year is when we grow potatoes and we, we've seen a good quality crop. And the, the reason that they got into this, you know, at least in this area, I, I believe there was research going on in Washington State as well, but the research in Maine and in Washington, the research in Maine about 40 years ago, they started to grow broccoli up here as a crop, and um, <clears throat> the guys growing broccoli would trade acreage with the guys that are growing potatoes, and the guys growing potatoes, they found a particularly high quality crop of potatoes mm. coming off the land that the previous year had been in broccoli. So that's why the scientists started to investigate to try to figure out what was going on. That's where they um, were able to kind of um, solve the puzzle of what was going on. And it was that uh, residue from the broccoli crop that, uh, which is in the same family, Brassica family, that that was the key. And, and then they refined that and they found that some species have even more ability than say broccoli. And that's how we got into the rapeseed. Now, when you incorporate yours, you using a harrow, a tiller. We we normally go through. We um, uh, my son Caleb, who now is taken over the farm, he goes ahead of me, and he's got a, a bush hog, so he's mowing that crop, chopping it up fine, and then I come right behind him with a chisel plow, and I'm chiseling about ten inches or twelve inches deep, and turning that under. So we get. 90, 95 percent of that uh, residue is getting incorporated into the soil. 
and uh, the best way is to have him right ahead of me and we, me right behind. The quicker you can incorporate that, uh, you're not losing that gas going out to the air, but you're getting it into the soil. That's right. That's right. I always tell people, cause I, what I do is I, I get on my mower and then I jump on the tiller. I always tell people before you mow it, make sure your tiller's going to crank <laughs> 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 because right. it doesn't work near as well. If you don't, you know, till it in green, uh, you're yeah. losing all those gases. We've even tried experimenting with after we till it in, then tarping one of our 30 by 35 plots and kind of trapping it in there even more. But that's kind of what you're doing with the plow is basically trapping it in there by folding it over. Yeah. So that's good stuff. Right. That's good stuff. Um, with potatoes, you know, we know crop rotation is really important. You practice that obviously where you are, you're not growing in the same spot every single year. Um, does the mustard, or well, let's talk about crop rotation with potatoes, why it's, it's so important. And do you, does the mustard allow you to shorten that rotation any? Well, well, we have a four year rotation, um, organic, we've, we've been farming organically for 45 years and, uh, crop rotation is one of the, uh, uh, most important things that any organic farmer can do. So we do a four-year rotation. The common rotation in the United States for potatoes is probably a two-year rotation. Potatoes, grain, potatoes, grain. Uh, some farmers now have, have seen the, the real benefit of adding a third year to have a cover crop that builds the soil. So they're doing maybe potatoes, grain, uh, clover and then back to uh, potatoes, and that's a, a a real improvement. In our case, we're basically trying to improve the soil for three years and then cash cropping potatoes for one year, and we feel good about that. Um, it cuts down the acreage of the cash crop, but you know our our goal is to grow the highest quality seed that we can so that our customers are going to be successful, and we think that that long rotation allows us to accomplish that. So um, we think that by having a long rotation, like we don't want to have another nightshade, uh, we want one nightshade in a given field once every four years and, and could be tomatoes, could be eggplant, could be tobacco. In our case, it's seed potatoes and that's it. Uh, so by rotating, uh, by having different like grain, you don't have a lot of common hosts with potatoes. Uh, and clover uh, and timothy grass. Uh, we put it into sod, so we're building up the organic matter. Uh, a lot of the soils in our area are one and a half or two percent organic matter. Our soils are about seven percent organic matter because of this rotation that we've been doing for 35 years or longer. Um, and uh, by, by having the rotation, you're breaking up insect cycles. You're breaking up uh, disease cycles, you're breaking up uh, uh, weed cycles. Some some weed seed uh, in a four-year uh, rotation, it'll rot in the ground before it can grow again. So uh, you're benefiting from that. So I, I'd say that organic farmers um, are very strong believers in the benefits of crop rotation. In our case, we grow potatoes and we harvest them in the fall. And as soon the day after we get them harvested, we plant that right back to uh, winter rye. Uh, we have a variety up here called a rustic rye, which is the hardiest um, winter rye that they've identified in the United States. And it grows well into the fall uh, when the soil temperatures have dropped. And then in the spring, uh, we'll start that winter rye growing when we still have snow on the field that's still melting. It'll start growing when the temperature is still in the high 30s. Um, so it does a great job. We under sow that uh, rye with uh, clover and timothy, and then um, uh, we get a good establishment of uh, clover, and we take an early cutting of clover hay for a uh, uh, small herd of beef cattle. And then uh, uh, we'll allow them to come out and graze the regrowth. And then that next year, we take a cutting of timothy, 
and then we plow it under, then we plant uh, buckwheat and the rapeseed. And we like the buckwheat as a cover crop because it's, its roots go down deep and it, uh, it'll bring up phosphorus that's in the soil mm-hmm. tied up. It'll bring that up to the top. So then when we chop that buckwheat and uh, incorporate that, that's giving us a reserve of phosphorus that we use for the potatoes that is that in that fifth year. Uh, following the rapeseed and the buckwheat. So we like buckwheat and rapeseed are our two favorite um, uh, cover crops, and we like to do them right before we get the potatoes planted the next year in the spring. I got you. I got you. Um, I struggle with buckwheat down here just because the timing. I mean, I've had it bolting three and a half weeks on me before. It's just, it's so hot. You know, it's timing it just right. To, to get a good growth window out of it before you've got to do something with it. Cause it can be pretty invasive if you let it reproduce. So it's um, I'd like to grow more buckwheat, but I just haven't got the timing on it just right. Yeah. It, it may be that buckwheat is a better cover crop for us in the North. Um, you know, we incorporate at about seven, seven to eight weeks at 5% bloom. Uh, we'll chop it and, and, uh, uh, incorporated at that point uh, down where you are, I could see that given the heat that you guys get down there, it, it may be something like crimson clover or something would be better for you. And and then if it's crimson, you do get that advantage. It's a legume, so you're fixing nitrogen. So that's mm-hmm. something that buckwheat can do. Yep, yep. And we've started doing a lot of cover crop mixes and and letting our chickens graze them throughout the winter, and that seems to be working pretty well so far. We're we're big big fans of cover crops for a lot of reasons, but you know, one of the main reasons, like you mentioned is that a lot of people don't understand is breaking that pest cycle. You're you know, not giving those pests a host anymore and, and trying to break that reproduction. So they're not just constantly multiplying on you. Right. That's right. Um, let's dig into some of your varieties. You want to do that? So sure. we, we grew this past year, we grew Caribe, we grew Huckleberry Gold, we grew Baltic Rose, and we, we grew Kuka Gold. Um, they they all did really well for us. I think probably my favorite out of those four would be the Baltic Rose, just because the you know the color and the texture on it's just you know amazing. Um, but but they they were all nice, well productive varieties for us. So if you want to talk about Maybe let's go through, tell me about some of your best tasting varieties in your opinion. Then we'll talk about kind of most productive and then easiest to grow kind of more forgiving varieties. Well, since you brought it up, uh, I'll talk about the Baltic Rose first. That's a, these are potato postcards. Every variety we grow, we've got a postcard for it. So this is the Baltic Rose. It's from Germany. It's a rel- relatively new potato, a long red skin, golden flesh. Can you hold it up just a little bit more, Jim? There you go. Yeah. Beautiful. I just cut that in half with my knife. So it's got a, a deep uh, uh, golden flesh. Uh, it's got, as you know, if you've been eating them, it's got great taste. Uh, it's uh, got a, uh, it's a fairly moist, uh, mid-range moist variety high yielding, they're beautiful tubers. Um, it's one that we've now been offering for a couple of years and it's quickly become one of our favorite and our customers uh, uh, are ordering it uh, uh, briskly this year. So apparently it's going over good, but uh, <laughs> it's one of the great varieties and the intensity of the yellow compared to say Yukon Gold, which is kind of the standard that it goes by. That's almost an off-white compared to the yellow right. of this uh, vault of those. Yeah. So we've got another one. This is a brand new one that we're just introducing this year. Uh, it's from Hungary. It's called Sharpo Mira. And uh, it's got a uh, pink skin, mm-hmm. golden flesh. And it was developed um, as a kind of an easy disease-resistant uh, potato. You can see the uh, gold flesh on it is probably about as gold as a Yukon gold. It's got a dry, uh, flaky texture to it, so it's kind of like a russet potato in terms of uh, 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 eating quality. It's got a great taste. Uh, 
and it's been um, it's from the Savari Research Trust, and they are trying to grow uh, varieties that do well on um, minimal inputs and especially under organic conditions. And uh, this is the first one. We've got others that we're uh, multiplying up that we're going to be uh, introducing here in the next few years. But the Sharp O'Meara is the first one, and uh, it looks like a really strong growing variety. The, the foliage is, um, is very uh, lush, kind of uh, shades the ground, keeps the weeds out. Uh, the yield looks very good. Um, from what research that I've read, it looks like the further north you are, the uh, longer uh, length days in the summer, that seems to uh, respond to it. So, uh, you know, if you're up in Alaska, you might get an even better yield than we can get here in Maine. Uh, but it's one that uh, we've been growing for about four years now, and we just uh, introduced it a couple of months ago, and and uh, it's uh, going very well. We're we're quite hopeful for uh, Sharp O'Meara. Uh, we think that it's going to fill a nice niche in the garden for a variety that can uh, give tremendous yields of a, a very dry, good keeping variety. Is is that then, Sharp um, O'Meara? Is that one going to be limited? You, you got less of that than you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, we've got oh three different seed lots right now that we're multiplying up. Um, so we'll we'll have a lot more to sell next fall. But we decided to go ahead and introduce it, uh, and we've got it available in one pound bags uh, this winter. Uh, and that way we thought, well, this way people can get a chance to try it, see how it's going to do. And we're, we're big fans of encouraging people to grow like what you're doing, grow three, four or five different varieties. And you're going to find some that do that much better in your locale. And there are going to be some that maybe that you like uh, uh, tasting them better than, than others. So the only way you're going to find that out is by experimenting yourself by growing the different varieties. Yeah. Yeah, instead of planting four rows of the same variety, plant, you know, a row of each. Or if you've got containers, you know, plant a different variety per container. That way you can kind of compare them. So uh, yeah. I always recommend yeah, I doing that. And, and it's nice to have, you know, for different cooking applications in the kitchen, nice to have some potatoes that maybe mash better. Some are going to fry better. And, you know, so they're all different. And, and I, I always like to plant we'll get into early maturing versus late maturing in a minute but i always like to plant like a row of really early potatoes kind of a mid maturing variety and then a late maturing variety that way i don't have to dig all mile at one time i'll dig one row this week wait a couple of weeks dig the next one and kind of stagger my harvest there that way if i do get some rough weather i'm not out there scrambling trying to dig you know four rows of potatoes before we get some heavy rain yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so you were asking me about popular varieties in this Caribe. I remember you got seed for this and grew it this year, but uh, the Caribe uh, was bred uh, right across the line in Canada. And uh, we've been growing this variety for about 35 years, ever since it was a numbered variety before it ever got its name. But it was bred by our friend, uh, uh, Dr. Hilke de Young who emigrated from Holland. And uh, this is one of his greatest successes. Um, and it's the only variety that we've ever said uh, in our catalog that this potato should be in everyone's garden. And uh, it's a purple skin variety with a white flesh. And what's notable is that it's extremely early. It's high yielding and very early. Uh, so if, you're, if you warm the seed up, you can get a crop uh, to where you can start harvesting in 65 days. So you can see it's a pretty white, white flesh. It's a dry potato. Um, it's got really good taste. Uh, some of the white varieties tend to be a little bit bland. The Caribe has a, a very good taste. Um, and it is just such an ABC easy variety to grow. Um, it's really the first thing to get from, uh, in the potato world, the first thing that you can harvest out of the uh, the garden. 
And back uh, 30 years ago, when the Colorado potato beetles were a real big headache, in the, uh, especially in the Northeast, the University of Rhode Island was recommending growing the variety Caribe, simply growing it as a way of battling Colorado potato beetles because they were so quick to um, come up through the ground, quick to grow the plant, quick to size the tubers that they could do all that before the uh, Colorado potato beetles have the ability to knock them down, which is a pretty uh, substantial recommendation for a variety when it can grow that big a yield that early on. And uh, it, uh, it's just a great variety. It's one of our most popular varieties. Uh, people seem to really uh, uh, like it. And, and it seems to be fairly universal. Uh, did it do well where you are in Georgia this year? Yeah, yeah, it did. It did. And, and I, I recall you telling me last year, you know, I've already got potato planting fever right now, but a lot of people, a lot of gardeners, they won't think about planting potatoes until they start seeing, you know, people like myself making videos about planting potatoes <laughs> or whatever. And so they're not quite as as timely maybe with their planting and you were telling me this variety is a little more forgiving if you do mess around and, and end up planting later because it's going to be maturing in a smaller window. You don't have to worry about the heat zapping it and compromising the end harvest. Yeah, that well, one of the most important things to understand about potatoes is that it's a cool season crop. And what that means, if you're in a northern tier state, you know, Maine, North Dakota, Minnesota, Montana, Idaho, Washington, we can grow them all summer long because it never gets that hot because we're so far north. <clears throat> but where you are, wherever it gets hot quick in the spring, you've got to be careful to plant that potato on time and to probably go for varieties that are short season and mid season and maybe stick, stay away from the long season varieties unless you have you know, some experience that they can fit in because once potatoes, um, they really don't like temperatures into the 90s. And once you get into the mid 90s, they can actually keel over and die. So what you're trying to do, it's, it's most important if you're in a hot climate that you get your potatoes planted on time and not too late <clears throat> because you want them to size, get the tubers to size up before that hot weather comes along. Yeah, yeah. You we well, can always tell a big difference here once it starts getting hot. Those plants go from looking great to, you know, pretty rough yeah. in a hurry. Um, go talk. Continuing the conversation about early versus late mm -hmm. maturing, we hear a lot of people talk about determinate versus indeterminate potatoes, and I'll let you, you know, go into this a little bit more. I've always kind of thought about it as a determinate is more of an early maturing, indeterminate is more of a late maturing. But down here, potatoes aren't really indeterminate ever because the heat gets them. So what is the real difference between a determinate and an indeterminate potato? You know, yeah, yeah. There seems to be a, a big fascination with that. Uh, <laughs> the fact is, Almost all the varieties are determinate varieties. Um, some of the older varieties, some of the heirloom varieties um, are indeterminate. Um, but, you know, of the varieties that we grow, you know, probably 80, 80 to 90 percent are, are determinate varieties. Um, so, you know, some have said that uh, the indeterminate might be better in container gardening to where you get kind of daisy chain growing. And, you know, the, the old variety Russian banana, the century heirloom that we offer, I know that that will daisy chain. Um, but really, if you're looking for high yield, finger weights are probably not the best uh, road to go down because, you know, they're grown for their high uh, culinary quality and kind of as a delicacy, but, um, uh, you know, in terms of um, uh, the best container variety that I know of uh, is probably the variety Elba, which was uh, bred at Cornell, named after a town in New York State, and um, uh, one of our customers, Gardner Supply in Vermont, uh, they did a study about, oh, 20, 25 years ago, 
and they grew 50 different varieties in containers to see which one would do best. And of all the varieties that they grew, the Elba came out number one in terms of container gardening. And we, um, we consider Elba uh, in the same class as a Kennebec. And to me, it's an improved Kennebec. Kennebec is a, is a main variety. It was introduced and uh, released in 1948. It's a great variety. It tastes great, nice, light, fluffy um, uh, flesh. But it's got some uh, real production challenges to it. And the beauty of Elba is it's every bit as good tasting a variety and it doesn't have these um, uh, problems in the field. For example, with Kennebec, unless you've got a high organic matter soil, the skin on the Kennebec tends to be a very thin skin and it's easy to get poked up with rocks or, you know, uh, during the rigors of harvest. Whereas mm. the um, Elba has a nice thick skin. It's not as thick as a russet, but it's got a nice thick skin. The Elba sets a high number of tubers for a hill. And like we were talking earlier, the best yields come when you've got a good set, a uh, good number of tubers per hill. It allows those tubers to size up. Canabac, you know, some some years you just get two, three, maybe four tubers per plant. And even if those go that big, you're not going to get that much of a yield because you just don't have that much. So we found that Elba is a great variety. Uh, Cornell did a good job breeding it. And um, after growing it side by side with uh, Kennebec for three or four years, we eventually, as much as we loved Kennebec, we let it go and and decided to go with Elba, which we think is a better variety. Yeah, I've tried Kennebec a few times in ground, and it, it just never performed that well for me side by side with other varieties. I'm not really sure why, but you're saying, so So we've got a new raised bed plot. We just started this fall, and I want to try growing potatoes in a few of those in addition to in the ground. So Elba would be a great one for like a small raised bed, that kind of situation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, or if, you, if you've got a whiskey barrel or a, a synthetic uh, smart bag, you know, to where, say, like if you don't have a backyard and you've got a balcony in an apartment, you can grow that. And Elba would be my my pick for that based on this uh, wide uh, ranging experience by Gardner Supply. I got gotcha. you. Awesome. And in yeah. in a container like that, do you recommend? Do you recommend a closer, can you get away with a closer spacing than say a, a traditional in-ground row? Uh, well, in our um, catalog, we sell two different um, smart bags, one a 15 gallon and one a 25 gallon sack. <clears throat> in the 15 gallon one, we recommend three to four seed pieces per sack. And in the 25 gallon, we recommend four to five seed pieces. You could put more in, but I think in the end, you're probably wasting seed and you're not gonna get that much more yield. Uh, it's gonna be like if you planted a 10 foot row of carrots and you didn't bother, bother to thin them, you're gonna get a bunch of baby carrots. Uh, in the end, I don't think you're gonna get any uh, more tonnage. And I think the tubers competing against one another are gonna be small. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. And the, the one thing that um, that I would say that if anybody is doing container gardening of potatoes, the biggest factor uh, seems to be inadequate watering. Like they're going, you know, potatoes uh, go through a lot of water. They respire uh, quite a bit. And I think people don't realize how much water potatoes need to keep that foliage up and to help tuber size, uh, tuber bulk. Uh, so uh, the ideal is to have, you know, um, like these fiber bags that allow you can't overwater because the water would just um, pour out the bottom. Well, if you use a whiskey barrel half, make sure you've got holes drilled in the bottom because you don't want to have too much water, but you do want to have adequate. And invariably, uh, the people that haven't had the best uh, success in terms of yield in the container it's because they weren't putting, uh, uh, pro providing enough water to where the plant really needed it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Speaking of yield. So it wasn't this past year, year before last week, we did like six different varieties 
and we looked at what our yield multiple was. So if we planted five pounds of seed potatoes, you know, what was the multiple as far as the harvest? And, and it seemed like, you know, on the upper end of that, we were getting about 10 times. So what do you consider like a good yield multiple? And then what's your be what's your most productive variety if someone's just wanting to multiply their seed stock to the, you know, nth degree? Yeah, I I think anywhere from a five to ten X increase. So for every pound that you plant, you get five or ten pounds back. Um that's that's good. Uh if you if you're getting fifteen or twenty X, you're doing really well. And we had one market grower, this is going back twenty, twenty-five years ago in Washington State, and he got he got rose gold from us. I think he got uh 350 pounds, uh, I guess I'm forgetting it now, but he harvested 24,000 pounds oh from gosh. several hundred. I think he had a 42X increase, mm. 24,000 pounds from just a matter of a few hundred pounds of, you know, it was, that's the biggest multiplier that I've ever seen. But I tell that story because it's an indication that if, if you're firing on all cylinders, you've got fertility good, your soil, uh, great till, you've got the uh, moisture, you've got the pests kept at bay, you can get a very good yield. So uh, one is, is to be uh, cognizant of making that seed go far. Again, try to get 10 seed pieces per ounce because you could, um, or 10 per pound, one and a half ounces each, you could easily use twice as much seed and not get any more yield. So that would cut down your uh, multiplying factor in half. But um, so be conscious of that. Uh, and then some varieties are, the, you know, the high yielding varieties. And I'd say Caribe has the combination of being early. It sets a good number of tubers uh, and it's high yielding. Yukon Gold, it's one of our most popular varieties. But that doesn't really like to set. Common set for that is three or four, maybe five tubers per hill. And you're just not, in most cases, you're not going to get the yield on Yukon because you just don't have enough uh, tubers per row foot. Uh, now, we do well in growing Yukon because we figured out its idiosyncrasy. So we cram the seed together really close in the row. So that would be the way to try to get your yield up on Yukon Gold is to drop your seed spacing rather than 12 inch in row, drop it down to nine inch to try to compensate for that lighter uh, lighter set. But uh, that's what we've done and we, we get a nice yield and you know the Yukon come out nice and uniform. It's a very u uniform variety. It's got great taste. It's got a lot going for it, but it's a little bit of a prima donna variety. It, it wants to have everything going its way in order to produce. So, you know, we like it, so we're willing to uh, flatter it to get the production we want out of it. But I'd say Caribe is a great variety. Um, I'd say this Baltic Rose uh, uh, looks like a real good yielding variety. And the Sharp Omira, uh, the research coming in from Hungary and, and uh, Wales, where it's been grown for a long time, indicates that it's a high yielding variety. So we're excited to be able to introduce that. As far as I know, we're the only one, uh, only seed company that's offering that variety now. Awesome, awesome. I can't wait to try it. Okay, so we talked a lot about varieties. Now let's let everybody know how they can get their hands on some of these seed potatoes. So if they want to order, they can go to your website, right? Which is woodprairie.com. Correct. And you got to, the, the, uh, computers are unforgiving. You got to spell prairie right. And uh, we came up with a name for our farm 45 years ago before <laughs> there was any giving. <laughs> we could have named it Acme Farm Company. Uh, but Wood Prairie, W O O D P R A I R I E dot com. And uh, we do have a free print catalog that if you want to, uh, uh, once you go to our website, yeah, you can. Yeah, there you go. And it's got Sharp O'Meara as the uh, featured variety. But we can send you a catalog, or if you like to just look around on the website, uh, uh, you can do that. 
I really like this uh, comparison thing y'all have in the catalog here that compares all the different varieties. Yeah, well, having 24 varieties is like having 24 children. Uh, <laughs> they all have a lot in common, but they've also got their idiosyncrasies. So uh, in some areas, you know, you're going to want to do um, a variety that might uh, be better in the heat or it might be a little bit more drought resistant, or it might be uh, longer dormancy, and dormancy is resistant to sprouting. So if you want a long keeping variety, you're gonna want one with a long dormancy. Uh, examples of that, Yukon Gold uh, is a nice dormant variety. Butte Russet is a nice dormant variety. Um, uh, Caribe, on the other hand, it keeps adequately well, but it'll tend to lose its purple uh, skin color about this time of year. It'll start to fade out. So by the spring, it'll look like a brown potato. In fact, we've had people tell us in the spring, you sent the wrong potato. These aren't uh, purple. And we said, well, <laughs> it's Caribe. We've been storing them for six or eight months and they've lost their color. But you plant that and, and you'll get uh, beautiful purple potatoes coming out of the soil. Yeah, I noticed that when I planted mine. The when I got the seed potatoes, the huckleberry golds look a lot more purple than the Caribe do as seed potatoes. But when you harvest them, it, they're a lot, it seems a lot closer as far as the yeah, shades yeah. of purple. Huckleberry gold, that, that's one of our favorites. It's one of our favorite eating varieties. Uh, the plants grow big and bushy. Uh, the, uh, the poor weeds have no chance to get any uh, growth when the huckleberry grows. But they're one of the best yielding varieties, one of the best tasting varieties, and it's it's also one of the prettiest varieties, uh, bluish purple potato with deep uh, golden flesh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So on your website, people can order one pound, five pounds, 10 pounds. Is that right? Yeah, we, we say anywhere from one thousand to one pound to 10,000 pounds. I got you. I got you. And as far as how many someone would need to plant, you know, X amount of row feet. I've always been able to cutting them up now. I'm getting five pounds. I can get five pounds of seed potatoes if I cut them up to, I usually have plenty enough for a 30 foot row. What do you recommend as far yeah. as pounds per row feet? Yeah, we, we figure um, um, one pound will plant eight to 10 row feet. And, and that again is uh, figuring on one and a half ounce seed piece. And if you figure that large hen's egg size tuber, that weighs two and a half ounce, cut that in half. If it's smaller than a large hen's egg, leave it whole. And if it's bigger and you need to cut it down, cut it into squarish blocky pieces that are about the size of half of a large hen's egg. Gotcha, gotcha. And as far as, it, you know, varieties, if people want to try a variety that you may run out of, you, the, you mentioned the Sharpo Mira. Is there any others that you usually run out of before others? Um, Prairie Blush is a variety that we discovered growing on our farm in 2001, 20, 22 years ago. It's a, a, a clonal variant of a Yukon Gold, but it's got um, a... Uh, a pinkish blush that covers a third to um, uh, half of the skin area, pinkish blush. And it's a moisture variety, but it's been recognized as a, a distinct new uh, variety. So that's one that we every year have a hard time keeping in stock. So um, prairie blush, uh, rose gold, another one that uh, we have a hard time growing enough. The demand is, is so strong. Um, and this year we uh, we had um, we basically ran out of land, and we don't have as much King Harry, which is this um, naturally disease resistant uh, variety that Cornell University bred, and it's uh, resistant to the three big pests in potatoes: Colorado potato beetle, potato leaf hopper, and flea beetles. So that variety, we just don't have that much of. We'll have more next year. We'll be back to it. But uh, we just ran out of uh, land uh, uh, when we were planting this year. So just one of those things. Uh, in fact, that was a crop, uh, that crop, we graded that today on the grading line. And it's a beautiful crop, uh, you know, 99% uh, 
beautiful, nice tubers, virtually no coals. And that's why we have a small herd of cattle. Any of the coals that we get from potatoes, we feed to the cattle and uh, they eat grass, they eat hay and they eat potatoes and we get inexpensive meat and we uh, get rid of our um, uh, college problem without uh, uh, letting it become a, a problem for us and, you know, coming back and sprouting and uh, causing a spread of disease. So our cows are mainly there to uh, control the potatoes and the, the beef is an added gift. That seems like the perfect cycle there. Everybody wins in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. As far as you mentioned, you can, you know, you've got this underground storage, which allows you to ship, you know, 10 months out of the year. So when someone orders online and it's, been a while since I did this. So remind me when someone orders orders online, they can specify their desired ship date. Yeah. Yeah. Um, most people let us decide uh, when to ship it. Uh, and we have a map uh, when you're going through the ordering process, there's a link and it goes to a map of the 50 states and it's color coded and it shows what weeks we, uh, we plan to ship to a given state. So most people just let us uh, ship at the right time for planting. But you've got other people, if you're going to green sprout, you may want that seed a month early. So we're happy to ship it whenever you want us to. And um, there's that opportunity in the ordering process that you tell us, I want you to ship on this date or default to that uh, shipping map. Right. Obviously, you wouldn't be shipping anything this weekend <laughs> with, the, with it being yeah, cold we, everywhere. We've been watching the weather, and uh, we, we actually shut down for the, we give the crew the week off between Christmas and New Year's. So uh, with this real cold weather coming, we've been uh, uh, careful about where we've been shipping packages this week. Potatoes are a perishable, and they will freeze in transit. And uh Fortunately, if you're a customer of ours, we guarantee freedom from shipping damage. But part of that means we got to be sensible and we don't want to ship out seed potatoes. You know, Haver, Montana is going to be 35 below zero uh, for a couple of uh, mornings this week coming. And it would be uh, a suicide mission to send potatoes to Montana this time of year. Right. I got you. So, so you know, if I say I order some this weekend and I want them say end of January, then, then you just, you're just looking for a window around end of January when you can get them from Maine to down here without them freezing. Yeah. Yeah. Usually uh, it's, it's getting them out of Maine that is the problem, but um, uh, we, uh, oh, we ship FedEx ground. And um, uh, when we ship, uh, when FedEx ground uh, comes, uh, the smaller packages we ship post office, the heavier packages we ship FedEx ground. So FedEx ground, the driver comes here between three and four o'clock in the afternoon, picks up the packages, they go onto the feeder truck, that feeder truck heads down to Hartford, Connecticut, about, I don't know, 400, 450 miles south of us. By six o'clock tomorrow morning, that package will be in Hartford and they're 20 degrees warmer than we are. So if we can get them out of here, if they're heading south, you know, uh, they've shipped potatoes out of here uh, by truck since uh, end of World War II. And the, uh, the adage is so long as those potatoes are moving, they won't freeze. They freeze <laughs> when the truck stops. So we get them out of here and, you know, 20 degrees, that, that's pretty significant. So we know we monitor the uh, low temperatures uh, predicted for Hartford and and Memphis and Chicago and Denver and uh, Haver, Montana. Uh, so we monitor temperatures so that we, we've been doing this 35 years. So we figured out pretty good how to uh, get them there safe. And if ever we make a mistake or if ever FedEx or the post office makes a mistake and they get damaged in, in uh, transit, no problem. Just let us know and we're happy to send out a replacement. We don't expect you to have to pay for old man winter's uh, 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 meanness, and in our case, we're we're happy that you know we don't we don't send out many that freeze. Uh, we're pretty careful, and we've been doing this for a long time. But you know, sometimes uh, some freeze, and that's life. And just let us know, and we can send out a replacement. And it, yeah, if they freeze, you know they froze because they turn to mush pretty quick. 
that a frozen potato, you can't tell when it's frozen, but you can tell after it falls <laughs> out and it becomes like wet sponge cake. And uh, it, it's no uh, it, it's no fun to have it. But uh, yeah, while they're frozen, they look perfectly good. But once they get into room temperature and thaw out, they'll uh, leak over the package and it's a mess. But uh, so we do recommend people order the earlier the better because we have the better selection and we can hold back their order uh, for months if they want us to. They can order now, they can have us ship in February, March, April, May, whenever it's convenient for them and their planning. And we've got ideal storage here. So some people like to self store at home. They're our customer and the customer is always right, but we've got perfect storage here. We can take your order in, we can keep your potatoes here in perfect condition, send them out right when you want. So uh, it, it's all, you you know, it's a good way to go, but don't feel that you've got to order now and that we have to ship now. Uh, it's common you. for us to hold back an order. So that allows you to get the best selection ordering now and avoid disappointment to some varieties. I mean, our job is to sell out all of these potatoes by the spring and some sell out sooner than we'd wish, but uh, you know, the earlier you order, the better a selection. Gotcha. All right. Well, I feel like I've learned a lot. I sure hope everybody else that's watching has. And thank you again, Jim, for agreeing to do this and coming on and educating us about all things potatoes and also kind of sharing some insights in your business. So we look forward to growing more wood prairie varieties this year. And uh, thank you again. Thank you, Travis. Good luck this year. All right. Have a good one. You too. All right. So that's a wrap on part two of our interview with Jim Gerritsen and Wood Prairie Farm. Hope you got lots of great information from that. I know I took lots of good notes and can't wait to apply a lot of those good tips on our potato growing this year. And I'm also looking forward to trying a lot of these varieties that Jim mentioned now that we have our raised bed plot here. We can try some smaller grow outs for some of these varieties. We'll still plant several rows of potatoes in one of our in-ground garden plots. We're probably also going to try growing some of these more container suited varieties in our new raised bed plot. And as I told you at the beginning of the video, if you want to try any of these varieties from Wood Prairie Farm, their website's woodprairie.com. Be sure to use the code LazyDogFarm to get 5% off. If you did enjoy this video, be sure to subscribe, hit that notification button, like, and share. And we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm. Oh, well. Mm -hmm. By the beauty of your life